This is chapter number six, towns, traders, and craftspersons. We'll talk about the towns, traders, and the craftspersons. In the medieval town, if you are a traveler and you're visiting, what do you expect? What kind of uh, the town it is that means the town has temples or it's an administrative center it may be a commercial town it may be a port or harbor town so these are certain pot possibilities and uh, in fact certain towns are like that they they embell or you can say they combine these all say several functions like the administrative centers temple towns uh, there may be commercial activities and craft production. So this is an example of some important centers of trade and artisanal production in Central and South India. If you see this, we have already discussed about this Madurai, Tirapur, uh, Tirupati and Tanjavur etc. Administrative centers, Chola dynasty. Now, if you are in Tanjavur, or you are moving in Tanjavur, the capital of Cholas, it was thousands of years ago. So what do you see? The perennial river Kaveri, it flows near the uh, town and the bells of Raj Rajeshwara temple, which was built by King Raj Raja Chola, you will hear those bells. And uh, the town people or townspeople, they are all praise of its architecture, that is uh, Kunj. Ramalan, Raja, Raja, Peru, Chantan, who are proudly carved this name on the temple wall. And inside that, it's massive Shiva, Linga, Shivaling. So, besides this temple, there are other there are places with mandapas and pavilions. So, kings, they hold court in these mandapas and they issue order in the mandapas to their subordinates. And there are also barracks of the army. Now the town, the town is bustling with markets uh, selling grain. We are talking about the Chola dynasty, how it will be. Selling grain, spices, cloth and jewelry. Then the water supply for the town comes from well and tanks. And the Salia weavers of Tanjavur and the nearby town of Urayar, they may be busy producing cloth for flags to be used in temple festival or fine cottons of the king and nobility and coarse cotton for the masses, other people than the elite one. And some distance away at Swami Malai, the Thapatis or you can say the sculptors, they might be making ex ex exquisite bronze idols and or you can say tall ornamental bell metal lamps. So when we see temple towns and pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage center, as we just saw that this, this is about the administrative center, we saw about a case study of Chola dynasty. Now the temple towns and pilgrimage centers, Th Tanjavir is of course an example of temple town. And this temple town it represents a very important pattern of urbanization, urban settlement, the process by which these cities actually develop. And the temples are actually the central point to the economy and society. So rulers, they build temples in order to show their devotion, also uh, to show their might. So they also endowed temples into grants of land and money to carry out various rituals. They feed pilgrims, priests and celebrate festivals. So pilgrims who flocked to the temples, they also made certain donations. So temple authority, they use this wealth to finance trade and banking and uh, gradually what happens, priests, workers, artists and traders, they all settle near the temple, right, in order to cater the needs of the pilgrims who are coming. And th this is how uh, the temple towns are grown, towns emerge around temples like uh, those of uh, the Bhilsa right now of Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh that is Bhilla Swamin and Somnath in Gujarat. There are other also uh, important temple towns like Kanchipuram, 
and madurai in tamil nadu and tirupati in andhra pradesh so these pilgrimage centers they also slowly developed into townships like vrindavan in uttar uttar pradesh and in tamil nadu we have the thiru vannamalai these are very the examples of uh, these towns also ajmer rajasthan it is rajasthan actually it was the capital of chauhan kings in the 12th century and it later became the suba headquarters under the mughals and it provides an excellent excellent example of religious co uh, coexistence where different communities live together so i'll talk about khwaja moinuddin chishti before that let me take you to this bronze statue of krishna subduing the serpent demon kaliya so this bronze or bell metal and the lost wax technique is used here so the bronze is an alloy this contains copper and tin and bell metal contains a greater portion of tin other than the kinds of bronze and this produces a bell like sound and this chola bronze statues were made using the lost wax technique so what what happens here what is this technique first an image was made of of wax first of all wax so this was covered with clay and allowed to dry next it was heated and with a very tiny hole uh, which was made in the clay cover the molten wax was drained out through this hole now this molten metal was the molten metal now is now poured into the clay through that hole and once the metal cooled and solidifies the clay cover was carefully removed and the image after that will be clean and polished so we were talking about ajmer khwaja muinuddin chishti the celebrated sufi saint ajmer ki dargah who settled there in 12th century to attract devotees from all creeds castes religion this near ajmer is also a lake called pushkar which has attracted pilgrims from ancient times a network of small towns from the 18th century after that the subcontinent was uh, dotted with very various smaller uh, towns and these uh, emerged from large villages and they usually had a mandapika or mandi mandi we call it right now also we are call these places as mandi to which uh, nearby villages would bought their production or produce in order to sell they also had market streets we call them at that time it was hata right now we call it them as hat uh, lined with the shops and besides there were also street uh, for different kind of artisans such as potters oil uh, pressers sugar makers toddy makers smiths uh, stone masons like this so while some traders lived in the town others traveled from town to town and many came from uh, far and near to the town to buy local articles and sell products of different distance places like horses salt camphor saffron uh, betel nut and spices especially uh, like pepper so this is a city market diagram if you see this is how it would uh, look like at that time so usually there was a samant or in later times a zamindar he built up fortified palace in or near these towns and they levied taxes on the traders artisans and articles of trade and they sometimes donated the right to collect these taxes to local temples and these temples which had been built by themselves by or by some rich merchants so these rights were recorded in inscriptions that have survived today also here is a picture of a wood carver and uh, there were something on market taxes market on taxes which we know by now uh, the this is the summary from 10th century inscription from rajasthan which lists that uh, the dues that were to be collected by temple authority so it was inscripted so we know what was taken at that time so there were taxes in kind so there can be kind or cash so kind can be sugar and jaggery dyes thread and cotton on coconut uh, salt areca nuts butter sesame oil and on cloth and beside there were taxes on traders also on those who sold metal goods butter goods or distillers or oils on cattle fodder and on loads of grain 
and some of these taxes were taken in cash somewhere in kind. Now there were big and small traders. There were many kind of traders as we said and this includes the Banjaras also and several traders especially the horse they horse traders they call they were called as they actually formed associations with headmen who negotiated on their behalf with the warriors who bought horses and since these traders had to pass through various kingdoms and forest and various uh, hostile areas they usually traveled in caravans and uh, formed guild in order to protect their interests and there were several such guilds in south india from the 8th century after afterwards so the most famous being the uh, mani gramam and nana desi so these guilds traded extensively both within the peninsula and with southeast uh, asia and china so there were also uh, committees like the chetiyars and the marwadi uh, oswal who went on to become the principal trading groups of the country and you also know that they are still apart from the gujarati traders including the communities of hindu banias and bohras muslim bohras uh, they traded extensively with the ports of red sea persian gulf east africa south east asia and china so they actually sold textiles and spices in these ports and in exchange bought gold and ivory from africa and spices and tin uh, chinese blue pottery and silver from south east asia and china so the towns on the west coast were home to arab persian chinese jewish and syrian christian traders so indian spices and cloth sold in the red sea ports were purchased by italian traders and eventually they uh, you know sell it to the european markets and they would fetch high profits spices which are grown in tropical climates like ours uh, which are pepper cinnamon nutmeg dried ginger they become an important part of european cooking also not even in our cooking but Euro european cooking and the cotton cloth was very attractive and this eventually drew the european traders to india and uh, we will talk about them shortly let us see about kabul with its rugged and mountainous landscape and you know hilly terrain undulated uh, land frames kabul in which is actually in present day afghanistan became politically and commercially important from the 16th century afterwards so kabul and kandahar they were linked to the celebrated silk route and besides that trader in horses were primarily carried on through this route only so in this in the 17th century jean baptiste uh, tavernier a uh, diamond merchant estimated that the horse trade at kabul amounted to rupees 30000 annually which was a huge sum of in these uh, those days so camels carried dried fruits dates carpets silks and even fresh fruits from kabul to the subcontinent and elsewhere and slaves were also bought here for sale see sales of said slaves were there so before we talk about craft i want to you know take your notice to this this is a 17th century and a shawl border and this is uh, a candle stand you know brass with black overlay how beautiful it is let me enlarge it and show you this is how it looks so beautiful at that time you know people have that skill to make all these so crafts in town the crafts person of bidar they were so famed from their inlay work in copper and silver that it came to be called bidri because of bidar so the panchalas or vishwakarma community consisting of the goldsmith bronze smith blacksmith mason and carpenter they were essential to the building of temples they also played an important role in the construction of palaces big buildings tanks and reservoirs apart from that weavers such as saliar or kai kholars they also emerged as prosperous communities they all they were making donation to temples so some aspect of this cloth making like the cotton cleaning spinning and dyeing they actually became specialized in independent crafts because of the need of that hour 
So as I said, this is a shawl border all by hand. This is um, sort of candle stand. The changing fortunes of town. There were some towns like Ahmedabad in Gujarat. It actually went on to become major commercial cities, but others like the Tanjavur uh, shrank into size and lost its importance. Murshidabad in West Bengal on the banks of Bhagirathi, which rose to prominence as a center for skills and became the capital of Bengal in 1704 and declined in the course of century as the weaver they faced a tough competition from the cheap mill made cloth which was coming from England. So we'll have a very close look and on Hampi, Masuli, Patnam and Surat. Masli, Masuli Patnam, it's Machali Patnam right now. So this is a view of a watchtower through the broken wall. This is a broken wall of the enclosure of Hampi. So Hampi is located in the Krishna. This is this we are talking about the architectural splendor of Hampi. So Hampi is located in the Krishna Tungabhadra Basin, which formed nucleus of Vijayanagara Empire founded in 1336. So the magnificent ruins, ruins at Hampi reveal a well fortified city and no mortar or cementing agent was used in the construction of these walls. Nothing was used, only the technique followed was the wedge them, you know. See there is nothing, in just, just a fine architecture of wedging them, that is interlocking them, okay, wedge them through the interlocking. No mortar or cementing was used. So the architecture of Hampi was distinctive. The buildings of the royal complex had splendid arcs, domes and pillared halls with niches for holding sculpture. They also had well-planned orchards and uh, pleasure gardens with sculptural motifs such as the lotus and the corbels. Uh, in its heyday in the 15th century, 15, 16th centuries, Hampi bustled with commercial and cultural activities. Moors, this is for Muslim merchant, merchants, Moors the name collectively used for them, Chetis and agents of European traders uh, like the Portuguese, they thrown the market of Hampi. So this is uh, a fortified city, a Portuguese traveler, Domingo Pace, he described this Hampi in 16th century like this. I at the entrance of the gate where those uh, pass who come from Goa, this kind had made within it a very strong city fortified with walls and towers. And these walls are not like those of other cities but are made of very strong masonry such as um, would be found in few other parts and inside very beautiful rows of buildings made after their manner with flat roofs. So the temples, if you see this, this is a stone chariot, Vithala temple, this is a stone chariot. So temples were hub of cultural activities and Devadasis, the dancers, they performed before the deity, royalty and masses in the many pillared halls in the uh, Virupaksha, that is a form of Shiva temple. So the Maha Navami festival, we also know it, it today by the name of Navaratri in South was one of the most important festivals celebrated at Hampi. So archaeologists they have found that the Mahanavmi platform where the king received guests and accepted tribute from the subordinate chiefs, this was the occasion. And from here he also watched performances like the uh, dance, music and wrestling bouts. So Hampi fell into ruin uh, following the defeat of Vijayanagara in 1565 by the Deccan, a uh, Deccani uh, Sultans, the rulers of Golconda, Bijapur, Ahmednagar, Berar, and Bidar. A word will come which is Emporium. So, what is Emporium? Emporium is a place where goods from diverse production centers are bought and sold. This is Emporium. So, Surat, this is the gateway of to the west. Surat in Gujarat was the Emporium of Western trade during the Mughal period along the Kambi, that is Khambat. Today's Khambad and somewhat later Ahmedabad. So Suraj was, uh, Surat was the gateway for trade with West Asia by the Gulf or Ormuz. And Surat have also been called the gate of Makkah because many 
pilgrim ships set sail from here. So the city was uh, cosmopolitan and people of all caste and creed lived there. So in the 17th century, the Portuguese, Dutch and English had their fort factories and warehouses at Surat. So according to the English chronicler, Ovington, who wrote an account of the port in 1689, on average, a hundred ships of different countries would be found and anchored at the port at any given time, hundred C. So there are also several retail and wholesale wholesale uh, shops selling the cotton textiles. The textiles of Surat they were very famous for their gold lace borders called as zari, and had a market in West Asia, Africa, and Europe. So the state built numerous rest houses to take care of need of people who would come from all over the world. There were magnificent magnificent uh, buildings and innumerable pleasure parks. The Kathiawar states and Mahajans, which were actually money changers. They had huge banking houses at Surat. It is noteworthy that the Surat Hundis were honored in the fair, far off markets of the Cairo in Egypt. See, Hundis were what is what was Hundis? Hundis is a note recording a deposit made by a person. So, the amount deposited can be claimed in another place by presenting the record of the deposit. So, it is that the Surat Hundis were so much honored far off markets of Cairo and in Egypt, Basra in Iraq and Antwerp in Belgium, they were accepted. But Surat began to decline towards the end of 17th century and this was because of many factors. First of all, the loss of markets and uh, productivity because of the decline of Mughal Empire. Control of the sea routes by the Portuguese and competition from Bombay, that is present day Mumbai where the English East India Company shifted its headquarters in 1668 and today Surat is bustling commercial center. Then fishing in troubled waters that is Machli Patnam or Musli Patnam. So the town of Musli Patnam as we say that it is Machli Patnam literally fish port town lay on the delta of Krishna river. So in the 17th century it was the center of intensity, intensive activity. Both the Dutch and English East India companies, they attempted to control the Machli Patnam as Musli Patnam as it became the most important port of the Andhra coast. And the fort at Musli Patnam was built by the Dutch. So, we have a word which is factor. This is the official merchant of the uh, East India Company. So, uh, there is a uh, thing which we got from William Methold, a poor fisher town. So, this is a description of Musli Patnam by William Methold. A factor of English East India Company in 1620. So this is the chief port of Golconda where the right worshipful East India Company have their agent. It is a small town but populous, unwalled, ill-built and uh, worse situated. Uh, within all the springs are brackish. It was first a poor fisher town afterwards the convenience, convenience of the road that is a place where ship can anchor made it a residence for merchants and so continues since our and the Dutch nation frequented this coast. The Kud Shahi rulers of Golconda, they imposed royal monopolies on the sales of the textiles, spices and other items in order to prevent the trade passing completely to the hands of East India companies. And fierce, fierce competition among these uh, various trading groups Golconda nobles, Persian merchants, uh, Telugu, Komati, Chattis and European traders made the city more populous and prosperous. Now as the Mughals began to extend their power to Golconda, the representative of Governor Mead Jumla, who was also a merchant, began to play off the Dutch and English against each other. So in 1686 and 1687, Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb, he annexed Golconda. So this caused the European companies to look for alternatives. So it was a part of new policy of East India Company that it was not enough if a port had connection with the production centers the, of hinterland. The new company trade center, it was felt, should combine political, administrative and commercial roles. So as the company trade has moved to Bombay, uh, Calcutta, Bombay means Mumbai today is Mumbai and Madras that is Chennai. So Mosuli Patnam lost both its merchant and prosperity and it declined in the course of 18th century. 
New towns and traders in the 16th and 17th century European countries they were searching for spices and textiles which had become popular both in Europe and West Asia. So the English, Dutch and French they formed East India Company in order to expand their commercial activities in the East. So initially great Indian traders like Mullah Abdul Ghaffar and Virji Vohra actually they owned a large number of ships competed with them. But later the European companies used their naval power to gain control over the sea trade and force the Indian traders like these to work as their agents. And finally the English emerged as the most successful commercial and political power in the subcontinent. So the spurt in uh, demands for goods like textile led to a great expansion of the crafts of spinning, weaving, bleaching, dyeing uh, and more with more and more people taking them up and you know, coming into this profession. So Indian textile designs became increasingly refined but this period also saw the decline of independence of craft person. They have to do or they have to make only what these people want them to make. So the 18th century saw the rise of Mumbai that is Mumbai, uh, Kolkata, Chennai that is Bombay, Calcutta and Madras which were nodal cities today. So, till now crafts and covers underwent major changes as merchants and artisans like the uh, weavers they were moved into the black towns established by the Europeans company with these new cities. So the blacks or native traders and craft persons were confined here while the white rulers occupied the superior residences of Fort St. George in Madras or Fort St. William in Calcutta. The story of craft person we are going to see later. This is a Bombay Street early 19th century. It would have been like this. What was going on elsewhere at this time? Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus. So in 15th century, Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus, in the 15th century, European sailors undertook unprecedented exploration of sea routes. They were driven by a desire to find ways of reaching Indian subcontinent and in order to get spices. So Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese sailor, he was one of those who sailed across the Atlantic to the African coast, went round it, crossing over uh, to the Indian Ocean. His first journey took more than an year. He reached Calicut in 1498, returned to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, the following year. He lost two of his four ships and of the 70, 170 men, only 54 survived. So in spite of the obvious hazard, the routes uh, that were opened up proved to be extremely profitable and he was followed by the English, the Dutch and French sailors. So the search for sea routes to India had another very unexpected discovery you can say fallout. On the assumption that the earth was round, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, he was an Italian, decided to sail westwards across the Atlantic Ocean to find a route to India. See, he landed in the West Indies. This is how the name has come, West Indies, Indies from India in, 90, in 1492. So he was followed by sailors and conquerors from Spain and Portugal who occupied large portion of Central and South America after destroying earlier settlements in the area. So this is all about this topic. Thank you so much and take care of yourself.